see. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Ellie Mason, and I interned at Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform in Burlington, Vermont, this summer. So Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and they technically have two full-time staff members, so I was the third member of the office this summer, and they mainly focus on advocacy and education, so spreading awareness about a lot of the issues that um, Vermont's criminal justice system faces, which are very similar to the issues that the entire nation's criminal justice system faces. Um, for example, racial disparities in the criminal justice system, um, the opiate crisis and the war on drugs, um, bail reform and monetary bail reform, um, housing issues, which I will all get into later in the presentation. Um, they also work on policy campaigns, so they don't really introduce things into the state governments, but they will um, support certain uh, legislative initiatives that are working to make the criminal justice system more just and work on more restorative and rehabilitative alternatives to incarceration. So three of their main projects that I got to work on a lot with them and see firsthand were called For the Sake of the Children, Locked Up and Shipped Away, and Ending un Unnecessary Incarceration. So For the Sake of the Children um, is a three-year project that is aimed at closing the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, which is actually right in the town next to me. So I see it a lot, and it is a women's prison in Vermont. Um, and with the goal of providing different or alternatives to incarceration for nonviolent female offenders with young children. Um, with the idea behind that being that um, these kids fo face a lot of trauma when their parents are incarcerated or their mo mother is incarcerated. Um, and a lot of the nonviolent offenders are drug charges facing specific members of the Vermont community. Um, so that is their target group. And the progress what that they had made this summer was talking to a lot of community members about what the alternatives look like um, to the women being sent to the correctional facility. Um, and a lot of what we talked about was a social enterprise idea. So kind of like halfway housing for the women to go and live with their children and have access to um, rehabilitative counseling and trauma counseling and um, family counseling and um, as well as job training and opportunities to work at the same time. Locked Up and Shipped Away was a very prominent issue and project that we worked on because we have um, about 270 Vermonters, Vermont prisoners who are located out of state in an out of state prison. So you can already think of some obvious problems with this, with seeing their family or having access to medications or health care. Um, so these Vermonters who were in a Michigan out-of-state prison were moved to this prison, Camp Hill in Pennsylvania, which has the capacity for 5,000 prisoners. So when 270 Vermont prisoners come to a prison of 5,000 Pennsylvania inmates there are, there are, that are, is already overcrowded, um, and it's a private prison, it creates a lot of problems. So a lot of the letters that we received this summer had to do with um, this problems with this move. So I, one of the big things that I worked on day to day was reading these letters and responding to the inmates who were in Camp Hill. Now we can't do specific legal work at um, Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform, but we, a lot of what we did with these letters was publicize what these men were saying in this out of state prison. So some of the problems were not getting access to medications that they needed just to stay alive day to day and stay healthy, um, not getting some of their possessions that they had in Michigan, not getting phone calls, especially to legal aid. They couldn't call prisoners' rights. Um, they couldn't call their families. They couldn't, and a lot of discrimination and horrible treatment. So that what we did with these quotes and letters was um, inspired the public to call our governor and our legislators to bring these Vermonters home. So the end goal is bringing all of the men who are in Camp Hill back to Vermont and eventually out of incarceration. So 
what I reflected a lot about on this was just the idea of basic human rights and the fact that some, if someone goes to prison, they don't lose their basic human rights and they still deserve treatment, basic human treatment, and they still deserve to have access to their legal counsel or even to talk to their family. So I, a lot of my reflections throughout the summer and reading these letters and talking to my boss and my coworker were um, about this campaign of bringing our, all of our Vermonters back from this out-of-state prison. And then ending unnecessary incarceration is kind of a broad issue that we worked on. Um, so some of, some of the things that lead to this, this mass incarceration problem in the country, uh, the war on drugs was a huge, huge problem that led to a huge boom in incarceration, led to a lot of um, new prisons being built and a lot of kind of disproportionate charges for very small offenses or minor offenses, first time offenses, basically wrong time or wrong place, the wrong time offenses. Um, bail reform, so you could see that this dis would discriminate, monetary bail would discriminate against impoverished people who can't afford to pay these ex extravagant bail costs and they would just go to prison because of that. Um, parole and probation issues. So, for example, um, if your probation says that you need to get a job as soon as you get out of prison or you need to go to drug counseling and that drug counseling is three hours upstate. Um, certain issues that are just basically unrealistic and are set up for failure. Um, housing is a huge issue. So a lot of Vermonters will not be released at their minimums if they don't have housing. Um, so we were trying to get rid of that requirement. And then the greater implications of ending in unnecessary incarceration is that it discriminates against a lot of very specific members of the population. So there's huge racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Um, employment, so un the unemployed are people who have lower income jobs will discrim be discriminated against and be more vulnerable to um, going to prison. And then once they're out, people who have a criminal record will have problems getting a job or voting and getting housing. So it's this, this horrible cycle of, um, of in the criminal justice system. So my research, what I did with the help of Dr. Bowie, was about racial disparities in juvenile incarceration. And I wanted to research this because um, originally, my interest in this whole topic was sparked by reading the book Just Mercy, which was the one Richmond one book, um, and seeing uh, Brian Stevenson speak at Richmond about this huge issue of racial disparities in the criminal justice system, and especially the problems in the juvenile justice system, because these are kids, they can't, they don't have the knowledge to defend themselves, um, or even really realize what's going on. So a lot of my research had to do with where in the process this takes place. Um, and what I found was that a lot of it is before they enter the criminal justice system. So it has to do with court intake and just the, that first involvement um, with the criminal justice system. So what I was really interested in and what I found was the use of risk factors in this process. So basically when a child or a a teenager is confronted, has their first confrontation with the criminal justice system and their case is being taken into court. Um, the judge and the jury and different um, actors in the criminal justice system will look at risk factors such as um, how they perform in school, uh, what their family structure looks like, where do they live, what is the average income for where they live. So things that have tended to sway towards racial minorities um, and pick vulnerable parts of these communities and deem them as at, at a higher risk of criminal potential. And so what my first, my solution to this whole problem and my original thought in this whole problem, in this issue was that instead of taking those risk, or risk factors and putting those children in a situation of at higher risk for criminal potential, you would take those risk factors and say the, we should pay more attention in the criminal justice system to children who might be more vulnerable because 
of their education or their family background or their family history or their race or their um, family income. So that was my policy idea in changing this system. I think that it is on the radar, but I think that it, there is a long way that we need to go um, in terms of fixing the problem. So this was one of the projects I worked on was a comedy show fundraiser. Um, and it was mostly about raising funds for it because they do a lot of advocacy and education. Um, and this was just a way to have a fun night and involve members of the community in what we were doing and raise some money for the organization. Um, this is a, another project that they do is, you can't see the bottom quote, but they publish um, a, an article of different quotes on a specific topic in the criminal justice system, taking quotes from different Vermont inmates. So I, um, on a slow day in the office, would go through and read these. Um, and I also watched some documentaries this summer that had to do with the criminal justice system that I would definitely recommend. Um, and lastly, I wanted to end with a quote that I received in one of the letters from an inmate in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. What value are we as men, especially when we know Vermont does not care for their people, convicts or not? We sit here, celled 22 hours a day. What purpose does this show us? That we are all not worth educating, learning new skills to help us, and getting a job upon release. What are Vermonters thinking about their Vermonters in chains? We are people, many hurting people that have been put here to rot away. Some just getting angry and some emotionally absent and losing hope. Mr. D'Amato and the Department of Corrections Kingpins must be smiling. As I've heard Mr. D'Amato say, it's about time you inmates see what real jail is. Well, Mr. D'Amato, you have no idea what a prison is. We all live in some type of prison. We need to learn how to love one another. It means learning to believe that people can change, giving people a chance to grow, learn, and become the person God made them to be. I welcome Vermonters to speak out. So that was another big part of my reflection on my learning this summer was, what do we do? We can't just get bogged down with how horrible the system is and all the problems and all the interconnectedness. Um, so what I talked a lot about with my mentor and with my family and my friends was the importance of educating others and just spreading awareness about the issues because that's how you bring about change. And I think that you, the social responsibility aspect is getting enough people to care about something that the change does come about. So that was kind of my takeaway. Um, from all of my work there. So I want to thank again Cassie for organizing this all and Dr. Bowie for helping me with it and everyone at the CCE for this great program.